I don't know if you've seen it, but if you go down to Lower Manhattan, where the um, World Trade Centers once stood, there is a beautiful memorial that has been erected right on that very site. There are two gigantic waterfalls. Each one is about an acre in size, and they are the footprint of where the Twin Towers once stood. Um, I was told that they are the largest man-made waterfalls in the entire continent of North America. And they are there, as you know, for us to remember Never forget, as it's said quite often, 3,000, nearly 3,000 innocent lives that were taken on the three combined attacks that day, September 11, 2001, in our country. Largest loss of lives from a foreign attack ever on American soil. Uh, most of us were around that day. Most of us remember what we were doing that day. Um, 3,000 roughly people died, and we should never forget that. But uh, you also know, I think, that every day, not just once, but every day, roughly 4,000 innocent lives are taken as well. It's a different attack. It, it's an attack upon a, uh, an American citizen. It's an attack upon uh, clearly the definition of, of innocence. Uh, it's an attack where these people have no say in what is going to be done to them. And it's an attack where most Americans have... Uh, turned a blind eye to the Holocaust that is happening in our country and around the world. And to the best of my knowledge, there's never been any kind of memorial like the 9-1 memorial erected in their honor that, that we might respect them and consider the lives that have been lost. As I said, I'd like to take um, just a week off and, and speak a, a special message today on, on the sanctity of human life as we celebrate that. And I want to talk about a subject that is uh, sensitive, I don't deny that, a subject that has been uh, very controversial. It's, it's split our society almost directly in half. Um, I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to shock with uh, all the specific details of how an abortion is performed. I'm not here to bring unnecessary grief to any woman that might have had an abortion or any man that impregnated a woman that caused an abortion. I just want to present the facts. And I want to present today a message of hope that I think will become more clear as we get near the end of this sermon. Um, when I was thinking about how to deliver this, there's a lot of different roads I could go down. And what I thought to talk about is to really aim my gun specifically at the, the heart of this debate. Because if you can answer this question, it basically closes the case. And the question that is at the heart of the debate is, when exactly does life begin? Um, is it when you are born? I mean, very few people would disagree with that. Or is it from the time that you are conceived? Or is it at a certain point of conception, maybe one of the, the trimesters? Uh, what exactly is going on inside a, a woman's womb for nine months? What, what is that? Uh, is that life? Or is that a, a potential of life? as we are told? Is that just a meaningless glob of tissue? What is that? Um, politicians obviously have shared their thoughts on it. We're hearing that in a very vivid way, the presidential race. Um, doctors have shared their opinion. Scientists, and the more that science is done, the more it is proving that it is indeed a life, but they have shared their opinion. Judges have shared their verdict as well, but what we need to really be concerned about today is what God says about this. I mean, God is the one that is sovereign over all things. God is the one that even pro-choice people would say God creates life. I mean, I've heard a lot that have said that. They just don't believe it's a life yet. God is the one that gives life. God is the one that, that makes babies. We can't deny that as well. So, so what does God have to say about where life begins? Now, the only way I can answer that question is to look at what Scripture says because the Bible is the only revelation that communicates to us God's will. Now, if you look in your Bible, you can read it cover to cover and you will not find the word abortion. But again, that doesn't bother me uh, because you're not going to find the word Trinity in the Bible either. So we're not looking for one specific word. We're looking for verses that we can take together to make a case to answer this question as to when life begins in the eyes of God. So let me just present what Scripture says. We're going to go through a lot of verses today. I'll show you what the Bible says. It's very clear. There's really no other side to this issue than what I'm going to present. And 
you can make that decision for yourself as to where you stand on this specific topic. Let's begin first point. You can see in your sermon notes there, when does a person actually become a person? All right. I read Psalm 139. Let me read it to you one more time, okay? David says, you formed my inward parts. You, God, wove me together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. I mean, David is making it very clear under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he was himself from the very moment of conception. That from the very moment of conception, it's not like a tissue was formed and then at a certain point, God got involved in the process. At the very moment of conception, God is working, he says. He uses words like, you are forming me. You are weaving me together. God is not separated from a child in the womb. God does not get involved when the child is born. God is intimate with the child the very moment the child is conceived. There is purpose going on here. God's hand is upon the child. There's a, a skillful work, it says. A very skillful work. And because of that, and because of God intimately and emotionally and physically being involved in the creation of a child, David can conclude that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's very interesting that when he talks about himself, he's talking about himself while he is still in the womb. He's not saying when I was in the womb, I was the potential of life one day, but I had life. In other words, he's saying that was me then when I was in the womb, and this is me now. From the very beginning of time, from conception, I've always been a person. Another great place that we could turn would be the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. Jeremiah, as you know, is one of the great prophets to Israel. And Jeremiah says this, Now the word of the Lord came to me, 1-4, saying, God speaking, Before I formed you in the womb, that sounds like David right there, right? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This even goes beyond what David said, doesn't it? David says, when I was in the womb, you, you had your hand upon me. Jeremiah is saying, before I was even in the womb, you knew about me. You called me to be a prophet before I was even conceived. It's not like, again, I came on the scene and then you started working and getting involved in me. We are not an afterthought Scripture doesn't support that in the eyes of God. Before you were conceived, God knew you. God knew that the day would come that he would make you a person. And Jeremiah is saying, before I was even born, God knew of me. And God called me to be a prophet. Paul says the same thing regarding his apostleship in Galatians 1.15. God who set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Now you might be called, not be called to be an apostle. I can tell you that right now, you're not. Those, those guys, that office is done. Prophet, well, in one sense, we're all speaking the prophetic word. But the bottom line is, all of us can say that God knew me even before he fearfully and wonderfully made me. God knew me. There speaks of intimacy here. A few some more verses. Isaiah 44, 2. Thus says the Lord who form, made you and formed you from the womb. Naomi in Ruth 1.11, have I yet sons in my womb? <laughs> Speaking of personhood, right? Job 3.3, 3, you know, the man that went through all kinds of trials and suffering, right? He says, let the day perish on which I was born and the night which said a boy is conceived. Did you hear that? Not a tissue is conceived, but a human, a boy is conceived. Job 31, 15, did not he who made me from the womb make him and the same one fashion us in the womb? Psalm 22, 10, upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. 
I mean, we could just keep going. The Bible is so clear that from the time of conception, we are talking about a baby. We are talking about a human being. I mean, in the most simplest form, even children understand that. What's in mommy's tummy? Oh, just meaningless tissue, I guess. Right? No. Mommy took a peek. She did one of those tests when they put that thing on her, on her, on her tummy. And, and, I, and I know that in, in a few months, I'm going to have a, a little baby brother. He's there. It's a human being in there. That's my brother. He's got eyes and he can feel pain and he's got fingertips and he's got a heartbeat. That's my little brother in there. That's a human being in there. Another interesting verse, I'm just trying to come at this from a lot of different perspectives, is that classic verse in Psalm 51. Remember that verse, David, uh, when he said um, he had that affair with Bathsheba and he's broken over his sin, right? And then he says in verse 5, he says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. This does not teach that having babies is a sin. It's not teaching that. Yes, clearly some children can be brought forth in iniquity. A relationship outside of marriage. Obviously, rape would be the clearest example of that. But, but having a baby, the birth of a baby, the conception of a baby is, is not a sin. So that's not what this is teaching. Any theologian who knows this verse would make the clear understanding that this is talking about what we call in the, the theological world original sin. That all human beings are born in sin. And David is saying, when did I become a sinner? It's not, it's not so much when did I start sinning. We all sin. There's no denying that. Everyone in this room has probably sinned a few times today already. We're not even aware of it. That's not the issue. The issue is, why do we sin? Because we're sinners. It's not that you sin and now you're a sinner. You are born in sin. This is called the curse of Adam, right? This is Romans 5, 12 to 21. That from the very time of our birth, we are sinners. Original sin, born in sin. The curse is upon us. We need the second Adam to come to reverse the curse, who is Christ. Well, if I am conceived in sin... Only humans are capable of sin, so it stands to reason that I am a human from the time of my conception. Animals don't sin. Well, I mean, if you've got a dog like mine, it sins all the time. <laughs> Most rebellious animal on the planet, I think. But God's not holding their sin against them. That's not calling out animals for their disobedience to their masters. Not at all. Humans are only culpable of sinning before God because we've been created by God to pursue Christ. Animals haven't done that. So when David says, I've been a sinner since the time I was born, he is clearly saying, I've been a person from the time I've been conceived. Another great example is the Christmas story. Remember uh, Elizabeth? Um, is pregnant with John the Baptist. And then a few months later, Mary becomes impregnated with Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And the two kind of get together, and we have a record of that in Luke chapter 1. And the text says, when Mary and Elizabeth met, Elizabeth says, the baby in my womb, that would be John the Baptist, leaped for joy. Well, again, if it's a glob of tissues or just the potential for life, how, how, how can that leap for joy? There's obviously some kind of emotional response. And, and Jesus being in the womb of Mary, obviously is a person that promoted something in John to leap for joy, to be in the presence of the Messiah. John was emotionally aroused. That's personhood. That's personhood. And it's interesting that Luke speaks of the baby in Elizabeth, and Luke speaks of the baby in Mary by using the Greek word brephos, which is the word we use for baby. And it's the same word he uses for baby later on, of little babies outside the womb. Luke 18, 15 and Acts 7, 19. I mean, the point is, I think, pretty simple. That clearly, if you look at Scripture, and there's nothing that would speak to the contrary. In the eyes of God, the the little babies that we should love and respect and appreciate after birth are the same little babies that we should love and appreciate and respect before birth. 
It's personhood. Just a continuation of personhood. So if that's all the case, then what's God's attitude toward that preborn baby? If God's word says that is a baby, what's God's attitude toward the baby? First of all, you can see the first sub-point there. We need to understand that children, when they come, the conception of a child is the sovereign decision of God. Children do not come in a random way. When a man and a woman are together, those are the means, that is the means that God uses to produce a child. We, of course, know that. But just like we can't save anybody, we can produce children. Because we read throughout Scripture that God must do what? Open the womb. Genesis twice, 1 Samuel 119, Job 31, 15. You know, one of my greatest joys uh, being a pastor here is to take couples through premarital counseling. And I've done a lot of them. And many of you have been through, and I have uh, four couples I'm working with this summer that I'm really excited that I'm working with and plan to work with very shortly. And the very first thing I do, we spend four wonderful sessions together, is I go through what we call the great expectation quiz. Because as you know, um, one of the issues in any marriage is when you're coming into a marriage and one person expects one thing and someone else expects something else. I'm not talking about necessarily things that are right or things that are wrong. Maybe it's just the way you grew up. And one of the questions I always ask the couples is, let me ask you, when you'd like to have children? Well, there's going to be an issue here. If someone says, yeah, you know, I mean, a honeymoon baby. And someone says, uh, 10 years at least down the line. You guys better figure this thing out here, folks, right? Or someone says, oh, I came from a big family. I want eight kids. And, and the lady is like, one max, you know? <laughs> we, we, we can have problems here. One is not right and one is not wrong. Let's just make sure our expectations are on the same page. But I'm always very careful to say, you don't get to call the shots on this, ultimately. It's really not your decision. It's God's decision. You, 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 you can't make life. God is the one that must grant life. And for some people, he grants a lot of life, and for some, he doesn't. And I don't know why, but he's got wise purposes in doing that. But right from the very beginning, the Bible teaches if life comes, it is according to the will of God. It's not outside of God's will. It is God's will that brings forth life. Listen to Job again from 33.4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. There it is. Psalm 100. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. You're made by God. You're God's decision to be here. You're not an afterthought. This was His pre-planned, sovereign decision even before you were born. To have you come forth in a certain point, and if we continue to read Psalm 139, have a certain number of days that have been assigned to your care until the day he chooses to end your life. That's why the psalmist concluded in Psalm 127, a verse you all know, Behold, the children are what? A gift from the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is a reward. You can't take credit. You praise God for every child you have because that's a gift that God has given you. And I'm not just speaking that to parents. I'm speaking that to all of you. You're a gift. You were sovereignly called by God to come into this world. You have meaning, you have dignity, and you have purpose. It goes to the next thing. Since God is the, the giver of life, we also need to understand that every time God gives life, and this is what's very unique, he stamps his very image upon every human being. Now again, most people wouldn't deny that. Most people that are pro-choice would not deny the fact that humans are made in the image of God. But the question I have then is simply this. When do we get that? When do we get it? Is it we're nothing, and then the split second we're born, God's like, Phew! image. If it's not then, at it, it, what point in the pregnancy? I mean, how can you argue it? Eight weeks in? 16 weeks in? 
The last day before you're born? I mean, when do you get it? I think the only rational answer is that the very split second you are conceived, if that is indeed a baby, God's image is placed upon you. And that makes you different than every other life form in creation. And this is, one of, I think, one of the biggest knocks of evolution being taught to all of our children in the public schools. Because this part is omitted. How can you go from science class to health class and hear about the crazy self-esteem movement when you just got done hearing from your science teacher that basically you have the same worth as the housefly? Because you just all came from the glob, the goo. How, how does that make you feel good about yourself? How does that give you purpose to live? Then I look at a worm on the ground and say, that worm technically has as much value as me because we both evolved from this meaningless substance together. No wonder people are depressed. And I'm not against loving animals. It's okay to love animals. It's okay to have pets. It's okay to cry when your dog dies. It's okay to have the, the cat in the family picture. It's okay to clean up the universe. I want to clean oceans that I swim in. I'm not against any of that. All I'm saying is don't assign to creation, animals and environment, the same value we should be assigning to people. That's all I'm saying. Let everything, I think some Christians have gone just so far the other way. Let everything stay in its proper place. Our dog Misty was not created in the image of God. And I, like I said, the way she acts, I can prove it to you. She was not. You say, if we're in the image of God, why is there so much sin in the world? Well, we go back to Adam. This, this proves the curse. Because we're all creating the image of God, but that image is marred. Ever since the fall, the image is messed up. We're all messed up. But that does not mean that the image is not there. We have a dignity, we have a value that exceeds all other life forms. Psalm 8.5 says we were crowned with glory and majesty. Did you hear that? That's you. It's not, it's not um, relative based upon externals. You don't have more value because you have more money or you have a greater education or you're male or you're female. Or you're white or black? Or you're older or you're young? Or you have usefulness to society? Or I'd even argue even if you have horrible morality. None of that matters. All that matters is it's another human being. It's another person. It could be that poor little kid that's being teased all day at the, at the lunchroom and in fourth grade because he's awkward and no one likes to be around him and he's an easy target and he just looks like a piece of dirt and people just trash this poor kid without any mercy and that poor kid walks home sad and depressed that kid's got value because he's a human being or that senior that has been abandoned by her family who is 94 years old and she's in some nursing home with a, a blanket over her lap and sleeping 22 hours a day in a wheelchair. She's got value because she's a human being created in the image of God. It's intrinsic. You can't change it. And you wouldn't want to, would you? You are special. You are a sovereign special decision by God known before you were born, created and fashioned by God's hands within the womb to be on this world, to have purpose, to have relationship with God. No animals have that. Look at every tribe, as primitive as it might be. There's a religious instinct, right? I don't see that in ants. You're more valuable than every humpback whale that's swimming in the ocean right now. 
Do you know that? You're not equal to creation. You're set above creation. Because only you as a human being has the desire and the ability to enter into a relationship with God. And that's why Christ came, right? Did Christ come to die for the sins of animals? Of course not. Did Christ even come to die for the sins of fallen angels? No. He came to die. He came to give His life. He came to show love because you have value. You, I'm talking to you, have value in the eyes of God that Christ, even if you're the only person on this planet, will still come and give His life and pay the penalty for the complete pardon of all of your sin to reconcile you back to Himself that He might have now relationship with you. Which you can't have if you don't have Christ. And the beauty of it all is when we do come to Christ, He begins to sanctify us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit as we, as we go to church and as we read His Word and as we pray and fellowship with other believers, He begins to work within us. He's working in us the power of Holy Spirit producing fruit. In it. And what is happening? It is recreation. It is taking that marred image of God and fixing it and making you beautiful again because you are becoming more like Jesus. That's the goal of life, folks. Romans 8, 29, to be conformed more every day into the image of Christ, to long for that more than anything else and to work for it and realize by God's grace you just never fully get there and to be discouraged in a sense with yourself and with your sin and why do I keep loving sin as much as I want? Paul with Romans 7, right? The things I want to do, I'm not doing. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. I know better than this. And God says, just keep pressing on because the day is going to come when you will enter your reward. Because you get to heaven and you cross that threshold, now we got the doctrine of glorification. You'll be made like Christ for all of eternity. God's not going to let the image be destroyed and have Satan get the final say in this thing. He's going to reverse it and make it better than it was in the beginning. This is so beautiful. When we come to God, that image gets restored. Colossians 3.10, Christians have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This is God's love for mankind. And to show that love for mankind, what does he do? To show the sanctity that he has for human life, Christ, God himself, and the person of Christ comes down and does what? Takes on humanity. Incredible. Become, God becomes human because we needed another human to pay the penalty for us. He takes on flesh. That is his validation, his proof that human beings are indeed loved by him and are special. So based on that, what can we conclude regarding abortion? That God has created all humans all humans from the time of conception in his wonderful image and that God cares for and loves all human beings. But let me take it a step further. I'll make the argument now that God has a special place in his heart for some human beings. And it's the very ones that we kick to the gutter. God has a special place in his heart for helpless human beings, for persecuted individuals, for innocent people. And I think we could all say that a baby in the womb definitely falls in that category. Deuteronomy 10.18, God executes justice for the orphan and the widow. He shows his love for the alien. In speaking of new believers, Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones, not baby, but a new Christian who believes in me to stumble. There's anyone in your church that a new believer is trying to find his or her steps and like, what do I do? I've never done this before. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. trying to find. And there's some in the church saying, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. You can do that. Just follow my lousy example. It'd be better for a heavy millstone to be hung around that person's neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. 
God has a special place in his heart for a new believer. Special place. And he calls us to do the same. Psalm 82, vindicate the weak and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them out of the hands of the wicked. Christ has a special place in his heart for little babies. Hundreds of years before he ever came on the scene, we have all those prophetic verses. A great one is Psalm 72. And he, the Messiah, will deliver the needy when he cries for help, the afflicted also, and he who has no helper. And it was seen by his actions, was it not? When people back in that culture saw little kids almost as a burden, children as a waste of their time, Jesus is busy, folks. He's running around trying to save the world, man. He's casting out demons. He's healing lepers. He's getting people to walk again. He's got no time for the little kids. Get the kids out of here. They don't contribute anything to society. You know the verse. Permit the children to come to me and don't hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So again, just based on the Bible, what do we conclude? That God gives life, that God creates life in his image, that he considers life to be life in the time of conception, that he takes his stand for the innocent and the helpless, and that he loves children. I mean, what do, how, do we, how do we conclude any, anything else on this issue? But the Bible even gives us more definitive answers. Exodus 21, 22 to 23. If two men struggle with each other, and strike a woman who has a child. So you get the picture. They're, they're fighting and they hit a, a lady and she's pregnant. So that she gives birth prematurely. But yet there's no injury to anyone. He'll be fine as the woman's husband demands him. But if there's any further injury, again implied either on the mother or the child, then you shall appoint as the penalty life for life. So killing a woman, and, and it's funny because we still to some degree have this law today, don't we? That if you kill a woman who's pregnant, that's double murder. Well, if it's not a baby, why is there double murder? Someone ran in my office after first service and said, hey, do you know in the 9-1 memorial, it said there's a lady's name, and it, then it says, and her, ba- and her baby? Well, it's not a baby. Well, I'm going to take a life then. We well, you know it's a life. Amos 1.3, thus says the Lord, for three, three transgressions of the sons of Ammon and four I will not revoke its punishment because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. God says that was disgusting. Just to get more land. Proverbs 6, the Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. Taking a life that has been created by God, a life that has been stamped from the time of conception with God's very image. Genesis 9, 6 talks about that. It could be nothing else than murder in the sight of God. And it should be seen that way amongst every human being as well. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us as children of God to do all that we can to oppose the acts of abortion that are happening in our age. Who's going to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves? Proverbs 24, 11, deliver those who are being taken away to death. Let me give you some things to consider in a moment in point number four. But folks, if we're witnessing what we're witnessing today, man, there is, there is a holocaust on our hands. And I'm thankful that I'm reading statistics and polls that are saying now more than 50% of Americans are against abortion. The majority believe the way we believe. All the science is, is, is Christians are not against, science is our friend. Do all the science and archaeology you want. It's just making the case even stronger. But does anyone seem to care? Few people in the world do, it seems. I mean, most of the support is coming from the church, and sometimes you wonder people within the church that are standing out on the wrong side. I, I mean, I've, I've never seen it, I mean, so divisive in my lifetime. I mean, where were the, where were the days of, uh, you know, President Obama with, uh, you know, well, we're going to keep it legal, but we're going to keep it safe, and we're going to keep it rare, and remember all that? And now it's what? Shout your abortion. Celebrate it. What a society we've become. 
I'm going to get to those action points in a minute, but let me just give you, let me say one thing that I think that needs to be said before we wrap things up here. These sermons are hard to preach because based upon statistics, there are women that I'm talking to right now who have had an abortion. And it must be hard to hear this. There are men in this church who have got women pregnant who have had an abortion. I mean, this this is hard to really contemplate. I personally think the reason there is so much opposition against us, especially from women who have had abortions, is because they don't want to just sit down and contemplate what they just did. A mother's instinct above all else is to protect her child. And you went against that. There are women in this church that have been very vocal about the abortions they've had in the past. To inform younger people and to talk about the forgiveness that comes in Christ. And I want you to know that God can have compassion on you. The guilt, the shame must be unbearable without Christ. Either you, you say everything's fine or you just stick your head in the sand. When you really just sit down and think about it, how do you come to grips with what just happened? And now, as you know, many states, abortion up until the time of delivery. And people are celebrating this. The mother's had the abortion. The father, I've been to the abortion clinic when I've seen dads, parents, dragging a lady in, literally dragging a lady in because she didn't want it, but they wanted her to have it. Doctors who have performed it, politicians who have defended it. There's compassion from Christ. That's the only, that's the only hope you have. Jesus says, it's not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. We don't understand that. I didn't come to call the righteous. I didn't come to call people that are self- We're all sinners. That's not the issue. It's just that some are self-righteous. We think we're okay. God just loves me the way I am. He's obligated to take me to heaven. Jesus says, I came to call people that acknowledge that they're sinners and they realize they need a savior. I am a savior. That's what the name Jesus means. I've come not to call righteous, but sinners. Abortion is a sin. But folks, let's not go crazy here and be self-righteous ourselves if you've never had an abortion because we're still sinning even as believers. Abortion is a sin, but so is lying. So is complaining. So is fear, anxiety, worry, gossip, materialism, greed, lack of patience, lack of self-control, lack of kindness, lack of love. I need that doctor too. We're all sick. We all need a spiritual physician to make us well. Because only Christ came. You will not find any other Messiah out there, any other Savior out there, any other religion that teaches it's not you, it's all Him. To save us from a literal hell that we deserve because of our sins. But what I'm talking about here is not just the literal hell, the emotional hell that comes every time we sin. The guilt and the shame. You say, oh, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. You can be Charles Manson and still be forgiven. And if you argue against that, you don't get grace. We're all rotten. Sure, some are more wicked than others. I don't deny that. But we're all rotten. We all need forgiveness. And forgiveness is not given to certain levels of sinners. Forgiveness is given to all sinners. And it doesn't matter what the sin is because Scripture teaches grace is greater than sin, right? Regardless of what you did or done, how many times you've done it, God's grace is greater than your sin, the Bible teaches. I want you all to know, particularly those that might be dealing with the guilt of abortion, to know that there is forgiveness. You don't have to bear that burden anymore. Isn't that relieving to you if that's the case? You don't have to bear it. The Bible says when you come to Christ, you've got to come to Christ. When you come to Christ, Jesus takes your sins and casts them as far as the east is from the west. He removes them from his presence. He no longer is judge over you. Those sins have been paid for fully by his work on the cross. And if you keep heaping shame upon yourself, you're heaping more shame upon Christ because he's taken away the sin and forgiven you. Why can't you let it go yourself? 
Trust His forgiveness. Trust His mercy. Trust His grace. Trust the fact that He can heal you. He's a divine physician. It's done. It's over. Move on. Please, for your sake, move on. For Christ's sake, move on. If you're running around in guilt, he doesn't show himself to be a good shepherd. So, lastly, what can we do? Number one, I put them in your, your sermon outline. You can pray. Probably the greatest thing you can do, just keep praying. Share the gospel. You know, you hear about Christians getting abortions, but boy, oh boy, it's got to be harder for a Christian than a non-Christian to get an abortion if you understand this stuff. People come to Christ, there's going to be less abortions. Support your local crisis pregnancy center. We have a great one. Shrewsbury, you saw the video called Solutions. We have many folks from our church that volunteer there. They're doing a fantastic job. Fantastic. Giving women other alternatives. Telling them the truth when no one else will. Support these guys. Be vocal. Speak on behalf of the babies. They can't talk. Be their voice. When people get into conversations at work, don't be a scaredy cat. Speak what's right. Half the people out there, they said, probably believe what you believe, but most of us are just so scared to talk because the other side is just overpowering us every time we open our mouths. Share things on social media. Peacefully go to local abortion clinics. Peacefully. And just be there if women want to talk to you. Just your presence. I mean, I, we had a lady that came when we were in uh, Tom's River. Uh, that one closed down, thankfully, but um, literally said, I, I was going to have an abortion. And I drove by, and I just want you to show the baby. <laughs> Two years ago, here, here, here she is. And the one thing that prevented me from going on was seeing all you guys standing out front. They weren't out there shouting and screaming and holding up vicious signs and yelling. We're just out there praying. Just out there, can we talk to you? Before you go in and make this decision, it's going to change your life. Can we just talk to you? Can we share a side that you probably never heard before? Open your home to unwed pregnant moms that can't afford to live on their own. Stay informed. Call and write elected officials. Check to see your OBGYN if he or she performs abortions. Consider adopting, fostering. Teach single people the joy and beauty of premarital purity. If people got that, we'd stop abortions by 95%. Or close to it. And then in, as you saw on the bulletin, I just saw it. it this Wednesday, a pro-life rally down in Trenton. I'm going to try to go down. I'm going to talk to the staff. I'll probably try to go down and hit that. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to prepare. You don't have to talk. Just, just be a presence. When those legislators look out those windows, I've been down there so many times, and they look and they see, wow, there's 20 people. This must not be very important. They look down and see 2,500 people. I mean, that says something, right? This Wednesday, Trenton. 11 to 1, two hours of your time. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise you for being the giver of life. We praise you for stamping your image on every human being and giving us value and worth. We thank you, Lord, that you not only have made us in your image, but you've also given us the ability to be recreated back in that image again. Thank you for Christ, the forgiveness grace, the mercy that he offers us, taking away our sin. The sin goes away, the guilt, the shame goes away. Lord, we have true freedom. The, the shackles, the chains, the slavery is broken, and we are truly free. We truly know life. When though we understand we've done and will still do things that are not right, that the pain, the sting, the shame of sin is taken away, the conscience can remain clean and pure with you. And what freedom that is to go through life in such a wonderful way. Help us to be aware of what's going on. Help us to speak up. Help us to be engaged and involved. Help us, Lord, to serve you. 
May we all be motivated by Scripture, Lord. May we be motivated by your love that you have for those babies. May we be motivated to want to do the very things that you would want us to do that are pleasing in your sight. Please turn our society. Change hearts. I don't know if it will come in my lifetime, but I, I hope I'm around long enough to see the day when a whole generation can look back at this generation and say, what were they thinking? That this generation is judged just like we judge some of the acts in the founding of our country or we judge the Holocaust in Germany. What a Holocaust we have on our hands. Lord, bring about the day soon. And we all look back and say, I can't believe that we believed what we once believed. Help us to love life like you love life. Because life is special. In Jesus' name, amen.